My name is Jeffrey Engel, and I have the honor of directing the Center for Presidential History. And that means I also have the honor of introducing tonight's primary speakers, which I'll do momentarily. Let me first offer some words of thanks for tonight, and also a look ahead. My thanks go out to the staff of the center, of course, for pulling everything together for this conference, to Paul Ludden, the provost of our university, who funds all of our activities and supports everything that we do, to our colleagues who run SMU's campus out in Taos, where the contributors to this volume had opportunity to do a summer workshop to discuss their works and make them a little bit more precise. Uh, and to uh, Oxford University Press, who ultimately will publish the volume that emanates from this evening's wor work. Let me also uh, mention and say thank you to Susan Ferber, Oxford's executive editor for history, who is hiding somewhere in the crowd. Uh, I also want to take a moment to thank our partners over at the Bush Library and Bush Institute, uh, and in particular, Amanda Schnetzer, who heads up the Human Freedom Program over there, and whose help was invaluable in thinking through some of the complex issues about freedom that face the United States throughout the 20th and 21st century. And as always, let me give some thanks to you, our friends and supporters. Your continued interest and encouragement really helps us as we move along in our vision of making SMU a true center for the study of the presidency, that most powerful office in the world. So, we are thrilled to have you here this evening. But also I want to give a brief look ahead and ask you, if you will, to take out your calendars to mark a couple of events that we have coming up. First, on November 19th, we have a truly unprecedented event jointly sponsored by our center, by the Tower Center for Political Studies, and also by the Bobby Lyle School of Engineering. That night, we will host a senior policymaker from the National Security Agency in fact, their director of compliance, uh, who will uh, be coming to campus for what they are describing as among the first times that that agency has ever sent someone not only to speak to a college campus, but more importantly, to take your questions. Now, I don't need to tell you that the National Security Agency has been much in the news of late. And if you remember that their uh, nickname in Washington for the NSA is the No Such Agency, uh, <laughs> The idea being that they actually don't even have a public relations department. So the fact that they have chosen SMU to come be the first time uh, in their history that they've come to a campus for a public forum really speaks, I think, to what we're doing in national security and international affairs. So I encourage you to watch your emails for that invitation. Uh, and in addition, two nights later, we will host Peter Baker, who is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, who will be discussing his new book, uh, Days of Fire, Bush and Cheney in the White House. Now, as you can imagine, Peter is particularly enthused to present that book on this campus, which, of course, is home to the Bush Presidential Center. So it should be a fascinating evening indeed. So this brings me then to my purpose for standing before you this evening, which is largely to explain why we're here. Tonight, our five presenters will give you their thoughts on an important slice of presidential history whose consequences continue to reverberate in our own country and throughout the world some seven plus decades later. Four of them will discuss one of Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, truly explaining its particular legacy in history. The last has the unenviable position of telling us what the entire package means. My job is to set the stage, to tell you a little bit more about why we're here and what the world looked like to Franklin Roosevelt when he uttered his State of the Union address in January of 1941. We are here, fundamentally, to talk about freedom. Now, freedom is a, world, a word universally praised in American political circles. It is beloved by Democrats and Republicans alike, lauded and applauded by every president in the 20th century and, of course, before. It is ubiquitous. It is like the oxygen in the political atmosphere. President George W. Bush famously unveiled in 2005 in his inaugural address his freedom agenda, arguing, quote, freedom is the design of our maker and the longing of every soul. Freedom is the best way to unleash creativity and economic potential of a nation. Freedom is the only ordering of a society that leads to justice. And human freedom 
is the only way to achieve human rights, end quote. Now, ultimately, Bush would go on to argue that the only way to keep the United States safe in a complex and globalized world in the 21st century was to expand freedom's range and reach. Nearly a century earlier, President Woodrow Wilson had implored Americans to go out and make the world safe for democracy. In other words, to make the world safe for a form of government. Bush now went further, arguing that the world had to be made safe for an idea and for a way of life. As he continued, quote, we are led by events and common sense to one conclusion. The survival of liberty in our land increasingly depends on the success of liberty in other lands. The best hope for peace in the world is the expansion of freedom in the world, end quote. Now this is a dramatic statement indeed. In one fell swoop, President Bush argued that freedom was universal, that is, it is within every human being, and that it was essential to not only justice, but global peace. These bold statements, I think, are somewhat hard to argue with, at least hard if anyone wants to have a political career. Picture, if you will, the potential presidential candidate seeking office who decides to take the opposing position. A candidate who is willing to stand up and say, in effect, freedom, eh, take it or leave it. Now, most, of course, would never try, jumping instead with, on this bandwagon with both feet. Uh, as President Barack Obama explained, quote, I do have an unyielding belief that all people yearn for certain things, which boil down to this, the freedom to live as you choose, end quote. Now, he too argued that freedom was universal and intrinsic to the human soul, saying, quote, these are not just American ideals, they are human rights, and that is why we support them everywhere, end quote. Indeed, it's worth noting that freedom was the very last word uttered in President Obama's first inaugural address in 2009. With eyes fixed on the horizon and God's grace upon us, he said, we carry forth that great gift of freedom, end quote. So, what's the problem here? What's the big deal if presidents consistently praise this thing called freedom, using it in effect as a stand-in for the American way of life and as a shorthand means of describing their motiva the motivations of ourselves and in opposition of our adversaries? In fact, if you remember, of course, after 9-11, this was a common refrain, that the attackers uh, uh, did what they did because they hated us for our freedom. What's the big deal then if presidents decide to claim freedom and claim both as essential to, the American, to American foreign policy and to human global rights? Well, the big deal is this. The big deal is that this is a term frequently used but rarely actually defined and certainly not universally held to mean the exact same thing. Put simply, one man's freedom is another man's tyranny and America's enemies have throughout the 20th century not prove shy about calling foul whenever presidents speak of freedom. They suggest instead that uh, the freedom espoused from the White House is not at least the kind of freedom that they desire. Vladimir Lenin, for example, took time out from fomenting revolution in Russia to argue that, quote, freedom in capitalist society always remains about the same as it was in ancient Greek, Greece. It means freedom for slave owners, end quote. And by the same token, Osama bin Laden frequently lobbed rhetorical hand grenades at President Bush's use of the word freedom. As he said in one videotape, taped no doubt in a cave, but released some months later, quote, we fight for freedom too. Free men do not forfeit their security, contrary to Bush's claim that we hate freedom, end quote. The point then is this, the same word, freedom, used by world leaders in search of opposite ends. And I think one is hard pressed to think of two leaders less similar than George Bush and Osama bin Laden. Indeed, when one scratches the surface but a little bit more, one immediately finds that President Bush and President Obama have in fact distinct and significant differences in how they choose to define this same word, freedom. Bush, for example, in 2007, listed four fundamental freedoms of his own. These were the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and the freedom of assembly. 
Let me say those one more time. Bush's list included speech, religion, press, and assembly. Contrast that, if you will, from FDR's four freedoms here, which of course are speech, religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. President Obama, in fact, argued that it was the second of Roosevelt's list, importantly and not coincidentally the ones that did not appear on President Bush's list, that were the most important. He argued, quote, we must realize that the freedoms FDR once spoke of, especially freedom from want and freedom from fear, do not come from deposing a tyrant and handing out ballots. They are realized once the personal and material security of a people is ensured as well, end quote. Clearly then, this is a word that is malleable, even from the Oval Office. And yet it's also a word whose impact is undeniable. And it was much the same in January of 1941 when Roosevelt offered his own list in his State of the Union address that year. Crisis was in the air. War raged in Europe and in China. France had fallen. So too had Norway, the Low Countries, and Poland. And Britain was nightly being pounded from the air by German bombers, just as the Atlantic Ocean was weekly being filled by German U-boats and wolf packs destined to starve the British into submission. Roosevelt, in this moment of crisis in his State of the Union, called this moment in American history unprecedented for its danger. It was unprecedented, he said, because, quote, at no previous time has American security been as seriously threatened as from without as it is today, end quote. To meet this threat, he urged the Congress to step up arms production, to arm and supply America's allies, and also to loan the allies the weapons and material that they might need to beat back the Nazi cause. And these were no simple claims that Roosevelt made, nor were they an easy sell. For isolationism, of course, still ran high in January of 1941. Now, it was not quite as high as before, as it had been during the 1930s and throughout much of 1940. And in fact, more Americans, in fact, the majority of Americans, believe by the start of 1941 that their country should, in fact, be prepared to lend a hand in this epic fight against fascism, even if it risks direct, direct entry into the war. But if a, power, but a powerful strand of isolationism remained in Congress, especially, memories were still raw over the last war, the Great War, when Americans, of course, had gone forth to make the world safe for democracy. More than 100,000 never returned. And the peace that followed was, of course, anything but satisfactory. Consequently, a whole generation of Americans simply lost faith. They lost faith in particular in war's ability to prove anything, and they also lost faith in their nation's responsibility to tired and decrepit regimes back in Europe. As Ernest Hemingway explained in the mid-1930s, quote, we were fools, fools to be sucked in, in once in a European war, and we shall never be sucked in again, end quote. This is why, and this is a main point I wish to make to you this evening, this is why Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech was, at its most basic, a political speech. It was intended, first and foremost, to rally support for his efforts to further arm and aid the Allies. And it was intended, first and foremost, to put the country on the footing necessary to meet the impending global crisis he saw over the horizon. It was a speech designed at once to frighten, to educate, and to persuade. It was about politics, pure and simple. Yet it was also about something more. Roosevelt did more, of course, on that evening than just give Ameri Americans a reason to arm themselves. He strove as well to give them a reason to fight. As he explained, quote, men do not live by bread alone, and they do not fight alone by armaments either, end quote. The American people, from the soldier in the field to the factory worker back home to the farmer who fed them both, needed to know why, why they might fight, why they were about perhaps to go back on the promise of the 1930s, the promise of never again. And Roosevelt told Americans that they would fight and support freedom. For the four freedoms outlined on the screen, speech, worship, 
freedom from want and freedom from fear. More importantly, they strove to extend those American liberties to the world. Take note, if you will, the last line, last words of each of these sentences, everywhere in the world. This would be a global mission and a global crusade. It was, in his words, to create, quote, a new world order, a moral order, and a good society, end quote. And critics immediately assailed the audacious breadth of this vision. As Charles Lindbergh, the famed flyer, responded, quote, we have been asked to fight abroad for four freedoms, but there are other freedoms that our president does not mention. And one of them was the freedom to vote on important issues, such as the nation going to war, end quote. Now Lindbergh was, of course, a noted isolationist, and I must tell you, I think, a fan of the Nazis as well. Yet his words held much sway in 1949, in particular, his fear that what FDR had promised was nothing less than an unending struggle, a permanent war against any around the world who might choose to define freedom differently. This was a common critique, in fact, as Robert Hutchings, president of the University of Chicago, argued in March of 1941, quote, we are stirred, but not enlightened, by the great phrase, the four freedoms, which the president has used as the general statement of our aims. But if we are to be responsible, Hutchings continued, for the four freedoms everywhere, we must have authority everywhere. We must force the four freedoms upon people who might prefer to do without them, rather than accept them from the armed missionaries of the United States." End quote. What Roosevelt called for then by enunciating freedom in this way as a universal war aim of the United States was in the mind of critics like Lindbergh and Hutchings nothing less than the road to tyranny. For a government determined to define what freedom entailed and worse yet to make it the will, its will the world's course was a government that they believed in time would grow so large, so imposing, so fearful of foreign threats, so willing to see differences around the world as somehow likely to undermine American freedom at home, that it would in time suck the vitality out of American freedom overall. It would be, they argued, and this is a second key point, excuse me, it would be, not them, but Roosevelt's argument, and this is a second key point for tonight, it would be in Roosevelt's mind a government recommitted instead to solving the economic and social ills of a country which was still roiling from the Great Depression. The Four Freedoms speech was not only a call to war, and let me be clear, it was not a call to war. That would not come for another 12 months. It was instead a call for renewing the New Deal. And conservatives in particular considered this, of course, more, little more than a thinly veiled scheme for turning the United States into a socialist tyranny, or worse. In fact, as former President Herbert Hoover argued in response, quote, we should stop this notion of ideological war to impose the four freedoms on other nations by military force and against their will. Because as Hoover explained further in the quote, we have no fear of military defeat. Our only defeat would be if we lost our freedoms and the potency for good in the world, end quote. And in fact, I should point out that even FDR's closest advisors feared, genuinely feared the reach and scope of what he was proposing. When Roosevelt first dictated the first draft of this speech to his staff, ending with the phrase, everywhere in the world, his longtime aide, Harry Hopkins, literally recoiled, saying, that covers an awful lot of territory, Mr. President. I don't know how interested Americans are going to be in the people of Java, end quote. Roosevelt had a response. I'm afraid they'll have to be someday, Harry, he said. The world is getting so small that even the people in Java are getting to be our neighbors now, end quote. In the end, I think this was the broadest legacy of Roosevelt's Four Freedoms, this notion that American values at home were and should be the values of the world. This notion that freedom was universal, and moreover, as Presidents Bush and Obama seemed to agree upon some seven decades later, this notion that freedoms compromise anywhere in the world directly affects American security and liberty at home. This, then, is our starting point for this evening. 
This speech Roosevelt gave as a defense of democracy in a world filled with those who argued that democracy had had its day. Roosevelt, of course, argued the opposite case in words that continue to reverberate through our day. As the New York Times columnist Arthur Kroc explained, summing up all that Roosevelt had said in January of 1941, quote, more than a pact with his 130 millions of countrymen and countrywomen, it was a pact with mankind's ancient dream of freedom for the human spirit. It was a pact with free men everywhere, end quote. Our mission tonight, therefore, is to explore this, this pact, this legacy, its impact. And we will do so by looking at each of the four freedoms in isolation and then as a whole. First to the podium this evening, following me, will be a player from the home team, from our own SMU. As Roosevelt's first freedom expressed was speech, so too will Linda Eads, professor of law and associate provost, tell us about freedom of speech over time. And she will be followed by Professor Tisa Wenger of Yale University and Yale's Divinity School, who will discuss freedom of religion. Then, Professor Matthew Jones of the London School of Economics will describe freedom from want, <coughs> leading to Professor Frank Castigliola's discussion of freedom from fear. And one thing I should point out that you should all fear, very much so, is having Professor Castiglio's latest book dropped on your foot. Uh, and I'm happy to ex display here an advanced copy of a book that's going to be out in January or February? February. February uh, yet to be released. It's the full edited and annotated version of the diary of George Kennan, one of the most influential foreign policymakers of the 20th century. And then ultimately, following Frank to tell us what all of this means tonight, will be Professor Will Hitchcock, of the University of Virginia's History Department and their Miller Center for Public Affairs, where he was also Director of Studies. Four freedoms then, and one summation. And if we are lucky, we'll have a little bit of time in the end for discussion. For the sake of efficiency, I'll ask each of the speakers to merely follow their predecessor to the podium. And therefore, we will begin tonight with SMU's own Linda Eads. Professor? I want to thank the other contributors to this book. I've learned so much from them and benefited from their wit and their dedication to scholarship and learning. And I also want to send greetings from the provost, my boss, and from the president of the university, Gerald Turner. You know, I think this topic is well suited to me. I was discussing what I was doing with a friend of mine who I had uh, served with in the United States Department of Justice when I was a federal prosecutor. And I told him what I was going to talk about, and he said, huh, nobody's practiced more free speech than you have. <laughs> I don't know what he meant. Um, he also reminded me of a poster that they gave me when I left the department, with my going away party. They gave me some nice gifts, but they did give me this poster of this very regal cat sitting on a satin pillow, and the caption read, everyone has the right to my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't changed over time at all. I'm still the same person. Let me get to my topic. It, speech is the first freedom listed by Roosevelt. It's in the First Amendment of our Constitution, so it's in our first Bill of Rights. It's always high on anybody's list of rights. When I, have, when I teach constitutional law and I ask my students in the first day, list me a right that's guaranteed in the Constitution, and you would be shocked and appalled at how few they know. But anyway, <laughs> they always do get speech. It's always there. Um, let me begin with two vignettes that capture what I'm going to talk about tonight, because basically what I'm going to tell you is that the history of the First Amendment in the United States, and now has, it's developing in the world, is convoluted, it's a little bit tortured, and it's not as clear as you might think. So imagine it's Thanksgiving of 1957. The image is American in every way you can imagine. 
a tiny dining room in a small house that was built right after World War II when all the veterans were coming home and wanted to, a, a slice of the American pie. The dinner fare is pure Thanksgiving, turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes. Dinner's later than would be usual because the father was working an overtime shift and didn't get home until 7 p.m. Uh, the talk was lively, the guests were having fun, and then the discussion turns to whether or not to join a union. The mother is concerned about this discussion because it's ta tampering with the joy of the evening, and so she suggests they go on to another subject, and the father says, wait a minute, Roosevelt said I fought for freedom of speech everywhere, including here. Everybody laughs, and they go on and have a good time. Now let's turn the clock to early May of 1970. Imagine a bank of dorm phones. This was way before there were cell phones. And there were three pay phones on every floor. And every Sunday night, they were heavily used because parents expected calls home every week. So on this Sunday, a co-ed is particularly anxious to tell her parents of last week's events. She'd been protesting the war in Vietnam. And she, she knew her mother would be upset and worried about danger, but she was confident that her father would support her because he's always told her to stand up for what you believe. So she's stunned when her father angrily tells her how wrong she had been and how disappointed he was in her. She stammers, I have the right to tell my government when it's wrong. And her father says, write a letter. <laughs> but you should never be disloyal to your government in public. Walking away from the phone, she thought about Thanksgiving, Roosevelt, and freedom of speech. I know these, both, both these vignettes are accurate. I'm the seven-year-old at Thanksgiving, and I'm the co-ed in the dorm. And I take these to embrace what I'm about to tell you. Did my father change between 1957 and 1970? No, he did not. But I'll explain to you what he was reflecting, because he reflects in both those vignettes what I believe to be the two branches of free, this free speech narrative in the United States. The first branch derives from the common law that we inherited from England. And the first branch is more protective of the community uh, than we would think existed at the time, rather than protecting the individual. The second branch is more protective of the individual. What do I mean? So this common law that brought us the idea of some protection of our speech was a common law that says, government, you cannot restrain speech prior to its being made. In other words, you, no government can say to you, you may never speak on this subject. But this common law also said, you, the speaker, can be prosecuted by the government if you cross certain lines. So it was not, you, speech was sometimes punished. And when was it punished? It was punished when it was thought to disrupt civil society in specific ways. Some of these are well known to you, and some of them are a little difficult to uh, historically to understand, so I'm not going to get into that. But things like libel and incitement to riot, and there were other things that would disrupt civil society. So this first branch balances group and individual rights in such a way as to tilt a little more toward group rights. Now, on a continuum, you'd have total community <coughs> government control. And on the other side, you'd have total individual freedom. And so when we're talking about where it tilts, I'm not saying that this first branch tilted way toward what we would call uh, complete government totalitarian control over our freedoms. But it tilted a bit toward community interests. Now, if I polled you, um, I think you would, most of you would say that in the United States, our freedom of speech paradigm 
tilted more toward individual rights than group rights. But actually, the history of free speech in the United States tilts more toward group rights prior to Roosevelt making his speech. For example, prior to the Civil War, there were laws on the books, North and South, that made it a crime to discuss or publish material discussing slavery, all right? And people were prosecuted under that, those laws. There was, in, for example, in 1919, right after World War I, there were almost 2,000 prosecutions in one year under various sedition laws in the United States. Sedition laws say a lot of different things and there's lots of different language. And that's because understanding all that different language is why I can charge you so much money if I'm ever your lawyer, okay? But I don't wanna bore you to death with all that tonight. So, basically what syndical, uh, sedition laws say is there certain subjects that when you discuss them could lead to sedition and insurrection against the government and that's outlawed. Just by saying those words doesn't require any action or any proof that uh, action was likely to happen soon. It's just advocating. So we have a lot of prosecutions for laws that advocated for uh, nihilism, communism, socialism, right? We also had lots of prosecutions for people who were advocating for unionization. So it's this branch of the, uh, this branch of the narrative that is behind my father's reaction to hearing that I was uh, protesting the war in Vietnam. That some speech is just too dangerous for the good of the community to be permitted. At the time that Roosevelt made his speech in January of 1941, this was the dominant aspect of free speech jurisdiction, jurisprudence in the United States. You can't stop speech, but you can punish it after it's been uh, said. And this kind of punishment can come even from speech that is at a much lower threat level than, for example, shouting fire in a crowded theater. So what did Roosevelt consider to be covered by his concept of speech in making this famous delivery of the State of the Union? We don't know for certain. There's lots of history about how he uh, composed it. But we do know that given the historical backdrop of what all Americans knew were the limits on First Amendment protection, that it's likely that he felt that speech was a lot more circumscribed than it is in modern America. Does that make his invoking free speech as one of the four freedoms any less valid? And my answer is absolutely not. And let me turn to the second branch of the free speech narrative in the United States, the branch that says the individual needs protection from government interference with liberty, and that liberty in includes very strongly freedom of speech. So the, the second branch does not allow punishment as regularly as the first branch of the narrative would for individual speech. And that was the part that my father was thinking about on Thanksgiving, when he said, oh, Roosevelt says I have free speech and it's even here in this house at this dinner table. Oh, standing up to his Greek wife who was explosive and who knew what was gonna happen. <laughs> so what happened after Roosevelt's speech was that in fact, we developed an American jurisprudence that is a lot more protective of individual speech. And you have to understand, of course, this happened. Because after Roosevelt's speech, after everything that was said about our reason for, World War, for fighting in World War II, there was something almost sinister about any aspect that regulated that speech, to curtailed that speech. We were fighting the Nazis for an ideal and the idea that someone could be prosecuted for wanting to join a union was contrary to that ideal. And over time, the legal jurisprudence of the United States extracted itself from that first branch, which had all that precedent. 
on how you can control speech. And we've now created very narrow uh, categories in which speech is not protected. These categories are libel, obscenity, uh, incitement to riot. But here, incitement to riot means you have to accompany that, be that statement with an actual showing. If, you're going to be pro if the government's going to prosecute someone for incitement to riot, they have to show that that rioting was likely to happen immediately because of the plan, not just because it was the kind of language that make provoke people. Um, obscenity is not protected, but there's lots, as you know, you do a little channel surfing now and then, you know that <clears throat> there's some sexual material that obviously is not being considered obscenity because it's not prohibited. So our definition of obscenity is so narrow that we have lots in the public marketplace about sexual behavior. So right now, and I'm exaggerating a bit, bit, right now our law in the United States protects almost all speech as protected by the First Amendment. And think about the examples, burning the flag, that's behavior that's considered speech, protected. Advocating for the overthrow of the government, unless there's an immediate incitement to go and do it, protected. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan marching in Skogie, Illinois, in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, protected. Wearing a swastika, protected. Proclaiming Osama bin Laden was great, and what he did was great, protected. Violent portrayals of sex acts between consenting adults, protected. Consequently, I would argue that Roosevelt's Four Freedoms uh, place free speech in a special pantheon that has developed in the United States over time to be even more protective of individual rights than when he said it. Now you're going to hear from my colleagues on want and fear and you're going to see that didn't happen in those categories as it did in increasing the protection for speech. So the question comes up, what goes on in the world today? Because what we were doing is we were trying to create a world in which many people had this freedom. And the truth is, we were, we were successful, or they were successful, or the world was successful in moving the target so that lots of people now have free speech. Do they have the same protections as we do have in the United States? Is it so now uh, almost totally protected in many countries that we consider democratic and free? And the answer is, I'm not an expert on all parts of free speech law throughout the world, but in two areas, I can categorically state that we in the United States are much more protective of individual liberty than in Canada, France, or England, or a number of countries, Israel. And that's because in those countries, you can be punished for engaging in what they call hate speech, and what we call hate speech, and for engaging in what they deem to be pornography at a, they call it obscenity, but it's really our equivalent of pornography. So let me give you a summary of what's going on in the world. Germany. Germany's constitution says we subordinate freedom of expression to the promotion of values associated with dignity and community. So the community values trump speech. And in Germany, for example, no one's allowed to wear a swastika. Now we can understand that given the history, but it's an interesting way of looking at freedom of speech. Canada, freedom of expression is inferior, inferior to the principles of human dignity and community. There was a Saskatchewan resident who was convicted and put in jail for hate speech by declaring homosexuality as a sin. That wouldn't happen in the United States. France, limits on freedom of expression are meant to ensure all members of society e enjoy equal rights and are protected from others. So you see what we have going on is kind of like, in a more sophisticated and thought through idea, kind of like what we had in the first branch prior to Roosevelt's speech, which is community interests can trump individual rights under, the, under, under free speech concepts. 
And we see that in many countries throughout the world. Same thing with regard to pornography. Be one of my last points and then I'll stop. <clears throat> there was a law that was passed in uh, Toronto, Canada, and there was one similar law that was passed in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. And it was basically the same law, and it was a law that was drafted by two incredibly ardent feminists who wanted to stop the sale of pornography and didn't want it to be limited to obscenity. And they drafted a law that said, if you sell or create matter that degrades women, that's a crime. And so I can always imagine these two feminists sitting down with the city council of the city of Indianapolis explaining this law, because these people, they were a little, dressed a little weird and acted a little weird, but they got the law passed in Toronto also. That law was declared unconstitutional in the United States by the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. It was upheld by the Canadian Supreme Court. And what the court said was very interesting, the Canadian court. It said these kinds of, of uh, materials run against the principles of equality and dignity of all human beings. This material fails the community standard test, and this is really the important part, not because it offends against morals, but because it is perceived by public opinion to be harmful to society. So one, we see again that society is trumping individual rights. So what do we make of all this? It reflects the question that, ha that humans have always asked and will always ask. What is the appropriate balance between individual rights and community interests? When do we swing too much in one direction and not enough in the other? My paper will explore the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. By allowing the coarseness of our society to grow without regulating hate speech or pornography, does this cause us to increasingly hate each other and disrupt our civil society? Or will it allow free and open discussion so that the animus that exists, whether discussed or not, this problem exists whether we say it out loud or not, but by discussing it, can it dissipate by having the light of reason shine upon it? I don't have any answers, and I don't know anyone will have any answers. But I think it's important for the, those of us in this audience and for scholars and citizens everywhere to work on logical and fair limits that echo Roosevelt's vision that certain re freedoms are essential for freedom everywhere. Thank you. I want to echo the thanks. Um, to, to Jeff and to the Center for Presidential History for having me here. Um, it's been such a privilege to be part of this group and part of this project. It's also really a pleasure for me to ba be back here at SMU. Um, I have wonderful memories of my year here as a postdoctoral research fellow um, down the hall here at the Clements Center for Southwest Studies. Um, and it's great to see familiar faces in the room. I can hardly believe it's been 11 years already. Since that time, um, my daughter Sophia was born at the end of my year here. Um, I think I'm still the only Clements Center Fellow to have had a baby during my fellowship year. And um, she is a pretty strong-willed child and definitely interested in freedom, at least her own. So um, I... <laughs> I'm thinking of her as something of a guiding spirit for my talk tonight, and I hope that I can live up to her standards. Um, I am tasked today with the second of Roosevelt's freedoms, the freedom of religion. Or in his language, and as um, I'll explain later, it makes a difference, the freedom of every person to worship God in his own way. I should warn you from the start that my approach to the topic is quite different from Professor Eads. Um, so you can consider this something of a study in disciplinary contrasts. As a professor of law, she gave us a very illuminating legal history. As a historian of American religion and culture, I will offer instead a sort of cultural history. Um, I think it's crucial to see how differently different people 
understood, have understood this idea that it's not a simple, straightforward matter to say what religious freedom is and that its meanings and its cultural impact change over time. Americans tend to treat religious freedom as a sacred principle, and precisely because of that high regard, it gets invoked for all kinds of purposes, appealed to for sometimes contradictory ends. Rather than looking at how our legal frameworks of religious freedom have developed then, or even charting the successes and failures of this freedom, I'm interested in the meanings that have been attributed to this idea and in the contradictions and the limits that emerge as it gets invoked in public life. I'll start by looking directly at Roosevelt's idea of religious freedom and how a variety of interest groups made use of this principle during the war. This will give us a sense of how and why this freedom became so prominent in our cultural and political discourse. And of course, Roosevelt didn't invent religious freedom, um, but it did take on special resonance um, because he highlighted it in the speech. Uh, then I'll talk more specifically about how religious freedom worked and didn't work for Jews, both in the US and around the world, using um, American Judaism as something of a case study. Their story illustrates the strategic uses of this freedom for a religious minority in the United States and gives us a sense also of its limits. Religious freedom was limited not because the US restricted it in explicit or intentional ways. Instead, it was limited because most Americans, including Roosevelt, understood the concept of religion itself in ways that reflected Christian and sometimes specifically Protestant norms. Now, when Roosevelt named the freedom of worship as one of his four freedoms, he marshaled a powerfully resonant American ideal for the ideological battles of the Second World War. At a personal level, the president would seem to have had no necessary investment in this principle. He was a cradle Episcopalian from a wealthy family, never seems to have wrestled significantly with his own religious identity or convictions, and had no personal or inherited memory of religious persecution. Like most of his predecessors in office, however, he was deeply committed to religious freedom as part of the political ideology of Christian republicanism. Christian Republicans identify religious faith, or sometimes Protestant Christianity in particular, as the basis for the emergence of an individual sense of conscience, and thus as a necessary foundation for Republican or Democratic systems of government. Unlike most previous presidents, Roosevelt endorsed a relatively inclusive version of Christian Republicanism that incorporated Catholicism and Judaism as equal partners in the defense of American democracy. Yet there were real limits to this inclusivity and, and to the ideal of religious freedom as it functioned in American culture. Roosevelt's formulation continued in subtle ways to privilege Protestantism and even more so a broadly Judeo-Christian framework. This was the period in which that phrase became, um, com became used, common. His phrasing in the Four Freedom Speech, the freedom of every person to worship God in his own way, betrayed certain Protestant assumptions by assigning priority to the individual conscience, a formulation that sat rather uncomfortably, for example, with Catholic emphases on the rights and freedoms of the church as a corporate body. And by glossing religious freedom as the freedom to worship God, the president assumed the normative status of monotheistic traditions, such as Christianity and Judaism, and of religion more generally in contrast to atheism or irreligion. For the president and many of his contemporaries, such a Christian republicanism had come to seem, at, seem ever more relevant with the rise of totalitarianism in Europe, um, which, whose ideologies were more or less openly anti-religious. Roosevelt's approach thus assumed the necessity of both religious faith and individual freedom. This pairing resonated deeply through much of American culture um, and continues to do so, and it would frame the tensions and the limits of this freedom through the post-war decades. Now, I'm gonna liven things up a little bit with some pictures, not very many, unfortunately, but um, I have two works of art from the period that help me illustrate these dynamics. <clears throat> oh, um, 
actually I meant this one to be first. <laughs> Wrong word, okay. Um, the first is a Four Freedoms mural by public artist Hugo Ballin, and I apologize for the poor quality of this image. Um, this was painted for the City Hall in Burbank, California in 1943. Um, Ballin later explained that the large symbolic figure heading up the freedom of religion, which is the second, you know, image there, is Moses holding the tablets of the law. The figures arrayed below him are the Pope, a group of Jews with the Torah and ram's horn, and a Protestant clergyman preaching with worshippers below. There's also a Native American figure who Ballin described as protecting a flame. It's in the lower left hand portion of that, of that second column, the freedom of religion column. Ballin evidently intended this figure to recognize the continued presence of native people in California and elsewhere in the country, although the headdress is a rather stereotypical depiction that would be more characteristic of Plains than Pacific Coast identity. Um, the native figure also signals his desire to honor religious diversity even beyond the tri-faith framework of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. But by giving Moses pride of place, he paid homage above all to the construct of a Judeo-Christian America. And like Roosevelt, he stressed above all the idea that Americans were united in their commitment to religion in one form or another. Okay, now, as most of you will recognize, this is freedom of worship from Norman Rockwell's celebrated illustrations of the four freedoms, also painted in 1943. Rockwell portrayed a close-up of a subtly diverse group of individuals, their eyes closed reverently and hands clasped in prayer. The posture is one shared by most Christian and Jewish traditions, although it's more characteristic of some than others. There are subtle signals of religious diversity, at least within the tri-faith spectrum of Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, conveyed through the rosary held by the woman at the left, and by what looks to be a yarmulke worn by the man at the bottom right, who also holds a Bible or a Torah clasped in his hands. Above all, the image conveys a shared commitment to faith and to worship, implicitly contrasted to the suppression of churches under totalitarian regimes. But this celebration of a shared religiosity also offers a very clear sense of what counts as normative religion in American society. Like Roosevelt's language, the posing here evokes above all the individual's relationship to the divine. In that sense, it frames religion in an intrinsically, if not exclusively, Protestant way. The message is reinforced in the phrase lettered across the top of the painting, each according to the dictates of his own conscience, fitting very well with Roosevelt's phrasing. In all of these ways, Rockwell's image reinforced the president's framing of the freedom of worship as an affirmation of American religiosity that affirmed both Christianity and Judaism, but more so than Ballin's mural, continued to assume Protestant norms for both faith and freedom. Religious freedom claimed an important place in American public discourse not only because it spoke so well to the political moment, but because it met the needs of a variety of interest groups who had the resources to tout it. Among the most important of these were Protestant and Catholic leaders who invoked the president's formulation to support their own interests and agendas. These were not necessarily in line with the president's or with each other's. Well after the Four Freedoms Address, many Protestants and Catholics opposed U.S. entry into the war and did not really move to embrace the cause until the bombing of Pearl Harbor that December. Some of them argued that despite Roosevelt's rhetoric, the war was more likely to rebound against religious freedom than to advance it, especially if it benefited the Soviet Union um, or led to wartime restrictions on civil liberties within the United States. Baptists especially fretted that the freedom of worship formulation had been far too limited from the beginning and that it could be taken as consistent with various government restrictions on the public expression and dissemination of all religion, as in the Soviet Union, or with a single established church, and here they very much had um, Catholic nations in mind. Um, the Four Freedoms formulation also provided ammunition for ongoing battles between Protestants and Catholics that had little to do with the war. All of these appeals to religious freedom ensured that this ideal retained a heightened profile 
within the US, giving it a political heft that ensured the administration's attention in domestic pronouncements and international diplomacy alike. The idea of religious freedom had a great deal of utility for some minority groups within the US. American Jews were among the most enthusiastic supporters of America's entry into the war and of Roosevelt's formulation of religious freedom as one of the aims of this global conflict. The festival of Hanukkah fell two weeks after the bombing of Pearl Harbor in December 1941. And of course they have um, the persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany very much in mind. And rabbis across the lines of reform, conservative, and orthodox Judaism used the occasion of Hanukkah that year to claim the war as the newest episode in the perennial Jewish struggle for religious freedom. Sermon titles in New York City, for example, included the Maccabees and religious freedom. Now it is our battle and the Maccabees defeated Hitler. <laughs> Reporting on these observances, the New York Times explained that, quote, the festival commemorates the triumphant struggle of the ancient Maccabees for freedom of worship against the oppressive forces of Antiochus Epiphanes, Syrian tyrant. The link asserted here between Judaism and religious freedom was nothing new. Jews had long celebrated American religious freedom both as a way to assert their legitimacy on the American religious landscape and to combat the cultural and legal regimes of Christian privilege. By identifying Judaism as first and foremost a religion, World War II era religious freedom appeals also served to repudiate the racialization of Jewish identity that characterized anti-Semitism both in the US and in Nazi Germany. This American Jewish emphasis on religious freedom would become even stronger in the decades after the war when Jewish organizations developed a significant presence in legal advocacy on First Amendment issues. They did so at the very time when the Supreme Court was beginning to consider church-state issues, yet another development that reflected the cultural prominence of religious freedom in the post-war period. Jewish activists in this at this time unanimously insisted on a strict standard of church-state separation as a necessary foundation for religious freedom. And of course, they were not the only ones to, to, to make that connection. A stand that often put them at loggerheads with both Protestant and Catholic authorities. It's crucial to remember that part of the Jewish celebration of religious freedom was about holding the nation accountable to its promise of religious freedom. From a Jewish perspective, this promise was continually being endangered by Christian assertions of cultural authority, such as the practices of prayer and Bible reading and the celebration of Christian holidays in the public schools. Through their legal activism on these issues, American Jews helped define the separationist standard that dominated First Amendment jurisprudence for the rest of the century and became a crucial backdrop for the culture wars of the 1980s and beyond. But that's another story we don't have time to go into tonight. The broader picture of global Jewish advocacy efforts, meanwhile, revealed different limits to the American idea of religious freedom. After the war, the American Jews most active in international diplomacy emphasized the need not only for the freedom of religion and other human rights, conceived in primarily individual terms, but for the protection of Jews and other minorities as ethnically, linguistically, and even nationally distinct groups. The same framework their predecessors had employed in the wake of the First World War. Nehemiah Robinson of the World Jewish Congress argued in 1947 that if the International Declaration of Human Rights then being formulated by the UN was to be effective, it must specifically prohibit hate speech and incitement against minority groups. There's a connection to, to Linda's paper. Um, even if this interfered with the individual freedoms of others and must grant such minorities the right to maintain their own schools and cultural and educational institutions in their own languages if they so desired. As his memo hinted, religious freedom or any other human rights understood in purely individual terms simply did not address the experiences or the self-understanding of many European Jews. Indeed, for some Jews, even the concept of minority group rights seemed inadequate. Zionists had been arguing for decades that Jews must have their own state, whether in Palestine or elsewhere, as the only practical way to combat anti-Semitic violence. 
So where Jews in America were very strongly making the case that they're a religion, so they need religious freedom, um, you know, that, that sat a little uncomfortably with, you know, Zionism, both in the U.S. and, and um, elsewhere in the world, the demand for uh, a Jewish nation. Um, when the Zionist hope for a Jewish state in Palestine at last began to seem within reach in the post-war period, their advocacy quite logically did not frame Jewish concerns in terms of religious freedom. Instead, in the words of the Zionist stalwart rabbi Stephen S. Wise, they demanded the status of statehood as the only status for a free and great people, and the only thing that could finally provide justice and security for the perennially persecuted Jew. Although religious freedom appeals offered considerable cultural and legal benefits within the US then, this was not the case in most of the world where Judaism was not simply a religious category but an ethnic and national one as well. In such context, the concept of religious freedom was simply not sufficient. Now, moving into my conclusion, um, many of us think of religious freedom as one of America's signal accomplishments and as a real contribution to global principles of human rights. And while religious freedom has multiple sources and antecedents, not all of them American, um, in some ways this is true. Religious freedom was written into the UN Declaration of Human Rights in 1947, largely because of pressure from American diplomats, including Eleanor Roosevelt, who chaired the Commission on Human Rights and American interest groups. This declaration was never enforceable um, but it served as something of a model and an inspiration for many newly independent nations in the process of constitution writing. And around the world during the breakup of the Soviet Union in the late 80s um, and elsewhere, persecuted religious minorities have used this principle as a means of protest against repressive governments. In some respects, religious freedom has more cachet globally today than it did at the time of the Second World War. But it's important to see that American ideas of religious freedom are not universal, but they reflect the particular cultural and historical context in which they emerged. The bias and baggage this idea carries has limited its reach even within the United States, as we saw even American Jews who've so consistently celebrated American religious freedom have simultaneously felt the need to co remain constantly on guard against its infringements and against the expressions of Christian cultural authority that have marginalized them in very real ways. Um, I've also written elsewhere about the very real limits to religious freedom for Native Americans that remain in place today long after the US government ended the direct suppression of Native religious practices. I could easily multiply these examples to show how the religions that have been the most free in America even today are those that look most like the Protestant model for what counts as religion. It should therefore not be surprising that whatever the global reach and appeal of this ideal, it does not always travel well, especially when others perceive that Americans are trying to impose it on them. The freedom of religion is a worthy goal, but Americans should always have the humility to see that we've never fully realized it ourselves and that it will always be a moving target, both here and around the world. Thank you. Well, hello. Uh, thank you for coming. And um, I know you've heard it before, but I'd just like to thank Jeff and his team once again um, for arranging um, this wonderful project. Um, and uh, all the work, hard work they put into the, not just um, the last uh, day we've had some wonderfully productive meetings here, but also for the Taos workshop we had in the summer where we had a, a great time discussing um, the four freedoms. Now you've already heard some legal history, a legal history approach to looking at this, um, this subject, and you've heard uh, just now from Tisa with a cultural kind of approach, but my paper is much more um, political history orientated on the third freedom, on freedom from want. So the many Americans who crowded around their radio sets in January 1941 to hear President Roosevelt's State of the Union address, the third of the four essential human freedoms he propounded, freedom from want, probably have more immediate resonance than any other. With the United States having just endured a tra traumatic economic depression, unemployment and acute social deprivation were not simply part of distant and unhappy memories, but had been intrinsic to everyday lived experience. <clears throat> 
As recently as 1937, 1938, the economy had dipped again into a steep recession and unemployment had returned close to the levels seen at the height of the depression in 1932. Only with the surge in demand and productive capacity that accompanied war orders from the beleaguered nations fighting in Europe and Asia and the domestic military preparedness program did the economy start to move forward in 1940 and living standards begin to rise again. Having prepared his audience for the large-scale assistance to Britain in the form of the Lend-Lease Bill that was about to be presented, Roosevelt had also spoken of the sacrifices that would have to be made by all Americans in the emergency of the world crisis that they faced. As if to pull people's attention away from the immediate worries of the present, the president then turned to the four freedoms which would underpin the world that Americans might help to forge for the future. Freedom from want was introduced by Roosevelt as, quote, economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. It is clear that the four freedoms peroration featured in the speech was the product of Roosevelt's own initiative but the precise meaning of freedom from want still had to be defined, let alone a program devised of how it was to be achieved, both domestically and around the world. Earlier in the Four Freedoms speech, the president has suggested what he intended by articulating a set of goals which would have made the heart race quicker for radical New Deal liberals in his audience. The immediate crisis, Roosevelt professed, was no time to stop thinking about the, quote, social and economic problems, which are the root cause of the social revolution which is today a supreme factor in the world. The foundations of a healthy and strong democracy in his estimation included equality of opportunity for youth and others, jobs for those who can work, security for those who need it, the ending of special privileges for the few. Coverage of social security will be extended and medical care provided for all. And he added, the inner, uh, the inner and abiding strength of our economic and political systems is dependent upon the degree to which they fulfill these expectations. So freedom from want, this evocative and ambiguous phrase, represented the hope of a brighter future, where material abundance and prosperity might be widely shared, and a safety net provided for those still in need. In his famous 1943 portrayal of the four freedoms, the artist Norman Rockwell used the image of an excited and joyful family gathered at a table groaning under the weight of a bountiful Thanksgiving Day dinner to represent his own interpretation of freedom from want. Holding a job, providing for one's family, and aspiring to greater material well-being were all ideas which could unite Americans steeling themselves for the new challenge of global war, just as they resolved to never again experience the, st the economic conditions that have blighted the 1930s. The political standard bearer for freedom from want at home was Roosevelt's Vice President Henry Wallace. Wallace staked out his own vision of America's mission in his Century of the Common Man speech in May 1942. In this, he proclaimed that, quote, men and women cannot really be free until they have plenty to eat and time and ability to read and think and talk things over. The march of freedom of the past 150 years has been a long drawn out people's revolution. And when Wallace came to think about the, quote, significance of freedom from want for the average man, then we know that the revolution of the past 150 years has not been completed, either here in the United States or in any other nation in the world. We know that this revolution cannot stop until freedom from want has actually been attained. With peace would have to come, quote, a better standard of living for the common man, not merely in the United States and England, but also in India, Russia, China, and Latin America, not merely in the United Nations, but also in Germany and Italy and Japan, unquote. Wallace's call had wide purchase. Archibald MacLeish, poet, librarian of Congress, and New Deal advocate, reported to FDR in May 1942 from the latest, that from the latest polling, the four freedoms had, quote, a powerful and genuine appeal to seven persons in 10. From this, he inferred that the American people were idealistically in favor of, quote, helping to secure better working and living conditions all over the world while four out of five believe the country should and will help to feed the hungry peoples of the world after the war is ended. However, at the same time, seven out of ten people expected to be worse off after the war, and three quarters that there would be fewer jobs. By September 1942, the National Resources Planning Board, 
one of the wartime agencies, was producing pamphlets such as After the War, Towards Security, Freedom from Want, which spoke of, quote, the challenge to our national security caused by lack or inadequacy of jobs or income. It went on to assert that, quote, without social or economic security, there can be no true guarantee of freedom, and connected this to the needs of national defense. Wallace's challenge to the old order, meanwhile, found its musical echo in Copeland's stirring Fanfare to the Common Man, a piece which had once had the working title of Fanfare for the Four Freedoms, in which the composer consciously figured as speaking to the radical aspirations of a previously unheard class of Americans. Keen that the New Deal's legacy should be upheld, for a wartime liberal left coalition which included Labour leaders and such figures as Wallace, government had a key role to play in creating the conditions in which affluence could be delivered to all sectors of society, primarily by the promotion of full employment. During the presidential election campaign of 1944, their rallying cry was for an economic bill of rights. But to conservatives, it was the federal government's expanding reach and any notion of economic planning that represented the true danger to freedom and that could stifle business activity and the creation of wealth. Ostensibly a means to bring Americans together, the idea of freedom from want became a battleground, helping to shape one of the crucial debates in American politics concerning the proper role of the state and the fate of New Deal liberalism. During the war years, businessmen came to displace New Deal reformers in positions of power and influence, regaining the prestige they had lost in the 1930s. While the conservative bloc in the Democratic Party, not least led by Southern politicians anxious about liberal interest in challenging the racial mores of the region, began to assemble in full force after 1942. Thereafter, liberals fought a rearguard action as New Deal agencies were wound up by Congress and antitrust actions relaxed. The radical ideas were in retreat were symbolized when Wallace was dropped from the Democratic ticket before the 1944 presidential election. In that same year, as McLeish memorably put it, quote, liberals meet in Washington these days, if they meet at all, to discuss the tragic outlook for all liberal proposals and the inevitable defeat of all liberal aims, unquote. By the end of the war, Roosevelt's notion of an ongoing social revolution was an archaic memory. Indeed, post-war American exceptionalism was to become defined more in terms of limited government and the economic freedom of the individual. In a war fought against totalitarian regimes, and where the main post-war enemy would be driven by a state-centered ideology, or Soviet, the Soviet Union, it would be this aspect of freedom rhetoric, that which focused on the pernicious role of government that was to gain wide intellectual and political currency. There was, moreover, a trade-off between the four freedoms themselves, one that became increasingly evident with the post-war growth of the national security state. If freedom from fear, defined as protection from threats to physical security, was the chief priority of governments in Washington, this entailed a larger and expanding proportion of national wealth being absorbed by defense, leaving less for social programs. Translated onto the global stage after 1945, freedom from want had implied that the United States would take the lead in the struggle against poverty in a world emerging from the ravages of war. But overseas aid efforts, as in President Truman's Point Four program, quickly meshed with the all-consuming Cold War imperative to contain the menace of international communism particularly when newly independent states in the third world might be tempted to follow Soviet-inspired models of economic development. Idealistic impulses to, gener to, gen to generate uplift, in many respects a displaced form of activism on the part of frustr frustrated New Deal era liberals, were mixed with more calculating evaluations of Cold War strategic interests. During the 1950s and 60s, as an American ideology of modernization moved into vogue, U.S. information policy was designed to convey the basic point that the United States had formed its own version of a classless society, where the average worker could own their own home, acquire all the material comforts of modern suburban living, enjoy health insurance, and still have the, the, the safety net of a social welfare, welfare system if he should fall on hard times. The message of the 1950s to overseas audiences was that capitalism was not only for the wealthy, and that social progress could be achieved without the need for social revolution. By the late 1960s, President Lyndon B. Johnson, with the assistance of private American foundations, was promoting the Green Revolution in Asia, where Western technologies and agricultural expertise were employed to boost crop yields, feed expanding populations, and generate export surpluses. Echoes from the past were again apparent, 
as the United States pursued freedom from want in the myriad villages of Asia, while its armed forces tried to defend what was seen as the freedom of South Vietnam against the threat of communist insurgency and aggression. Yet freedom from want could still find powerful reverberations at home. Having venerated FDR as a young congressman, Johnson himself began his own war on poverty as president in 1964 in an attempt to tackle the problems of the quarter of Americans who, according to Michael Harrington's study, The Other America, published two years previously, still found themselves badly housed, ill-nourished and clothed, without proper access to health care and education, and scraping out a subsistent level of, subsistence level of living. Just as with the arguments over full employment policy and federal government intervention that occurred in the mid-1940s, however, the war on poverty and the problems it encountered also triggered again heart-searching debates from American liberals and their conservative opponents over the best methods for tackling some of the nation's most persistent social and economic problems. By the late 1960s, as during the Second World War, one had seen with the emergence of a conservative reaction the collapse of liberal hopes that building state capacity and reform efforts would help to solve the problems of American capitalism. In the international sphere too, the high tide of experiments with foreign aid programs had been reached as congressional criticism of waste and corruption multiplied and budgets were cut. By the 1980s, the notion of freedom from want as a goal of national policy had receded into, in, had receded into historical memory. Freedom for American capitalism, with a minimal role for the state, was the lodestar of a conservative backlash against liberal reform that had been gathering pace since the mid-1960s. But its deeper origins can actually be discerned in the years between 1942 and 1945, when, for example, the Office of War Information's attempt to popularize the third of Roosevelt's four freedoms had been checked by corporate promotion of a fifth freedom of free enterprise as embodying, as embodying the true ethos of the American creed. When communism collapsed in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union after 1989, almost 50 years after FDR's speech, it was the espousal of the free market as the route to individual freedom, which figured largest in Americans' understanding of what had produced this outcome. Thank you very much. In, the contrast, in contrast to the relative success of President Franklin D. Roosevelt and his successors in, protecting, in uh, promoting freedom from want and freedom of speech and freedom of religion. The effort to promote and secure freedom from fear has been, I would argue, less successful. The disparity between the uh, attainment of the other, uh, the other freedoms, freedom uh, from, uh, the other freedoms and freedom from fear stems from a basic dilemma. Since 1941, the United States has pursued foreign and military policies that have sought to project power around the world. Those expansive policies have been motivated by a desire to promote the American ideals of freedom from want and fear and freedom of religion and speech. To put it another way, in 1941, the leaders of that shining city upon the hill, the phrase that John Winthrop used to describe the, the colony of Massachusetts Bay uh, right, before the, uh, right before the Puritans landed. In 1941, the leaders of that shining city upon the hill climbed down from the hill and began a sustained engagement with the messy affairs of the world. The United States has accordingly taken on difficult responsibilities since 1941, gotten enmeshed in intractable regional disputes and has succumbed in some respects to the temptations of power. Despite its many successes, this deep entanglement in world affairs has also militated against a sustained freedom from fear. When the famous publisher, Henry Luce, published in Life magazine his essay, The American Century, in February 1941, which was only one month after Roosevelt's Four Freedoms speech. One of, when Luce published that essay in February 1941, one of Luce's senior editors warned that the American century, which Luce had laid out a vision for that American century, one of the editors warned that the American century would foster an informal empire in which the sun would never set and in which Americans would never be able to sleep. 
Well, the American century has indeed helped bring about freedom from want and freedom of speech and religion. It has not, particularly for Americans, I would argue, yielded freedom from fear. While it's the four freedoms that we're primarily discussing this evening, I also want to go back for a little while to refer to Roosevelt's most famous reference to fear. And indeed, the single phrase to which Franklin Roosevelt is most widely noted, and that is uh, his inaugural address when, we say, when he said, on March 4th, 1933, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that is indeed Roosevelt's most famous phrase. If you Google that phrase, there are 46 million references to it, at least there was yesterday when they did that, and to only 6 million references to Roosevelt's phrase, a day which will live in infamy, which is his comment after Pearl Harbor, and uh, 2 million references to rendezvous with destiny, which is a phrase from his second inaugural address. It's important to note that FDR in that first inaugural address did not condemn all fear, rather only what he called nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to, return, to turn retreat into advance. The key to understanding Roosevelt, his presidency, and indeed the subsequent history of the United States since 1941, is that Roosevelt appreciated the utility, the utility of fear. While shapeless fear was paralyzing, focused fear could mobilize action. Roosevelt, as president, drew attention to dangers and at times exaggerated them in order to spur, spur energy for combating the depression and the dictators. I use the word combating with intent. In that March 1933 first inaugural address, Roosevelt stressed the seriousness of the economic crisis and then he deployed military, military metaphors to describe how we would deal with the crisis. He said, the nation had to turn retreat into advance. He went on, we must move forward as a trained and loyal army willing to sacrifice. He warned that if need be, he would ask Congress for broad executive power to wage a war, to wage a war against the economic emergency. Drawing an analogy between the economic crisis and war helped justify Roosevelt's extraordinary executive power, while also legitimizing the federal government's intervening in an arena that many Americans, the economy, in an arena that many Americans thought should remain the private domain of corporations and individuals. Given America's limited tradition, only limited tradition of reform, and the nervousness that many Americans felt about an all-powerful national government, depicting the Depression as a war was a politically astute move, a politically astute way to forge the consensus needed, to, needed for aggressive federal action. As president then, Roosevelt mobilized fear. He mobilized fear on behalf of a vigorous plan to meet a grave challenge. That was the same formula that Roosevelt had used in the confronting the most serious crisis of his own life. Although Roosevelt never personally suffered want, he was a rich man, or had his own freedom of speech or religion curtailed, he did experience fear, indeed terror, in an intensely personal way. His companion, Missy LeHand, later testified that especially in 1921, 22, and 23, that is in the first two years that Roosevelt was trying to deal with his polio, when he struck by polio at the age of 39. During those first years, he often despaired that never again would he lead an active life. There were mornings, many mornings, Missy LeHand later commented, many mornings when he took him, took him until noon before he could gain sufficient control over his feelings so that he could paste on a smile and go out and, and see other people, even close, close associates. Roosevelt combated the terror of being helpless and bedridden by vigorously and indeed relentlessly pursuing a program of physical therapy. He regimented his daily routine and his public appearances so as to minimize attention to the paralysis of his legs while accentuating the strength of his upper torso. The crippling of his legs accentuated, aggravated Roosevelt's phobia, which he had had since, uh, since he was a boy, 
his fear of getting caught in a fire. As a young boy, he had witnessed a cousin burn to death. As part of his physical and mental rehabilitation, Roosevelt learned how to make the most of his remaining few muscles, muscles from the upper, upper torso and above. For hours, he would, he would practice a routine in which he would get down off the floor, get down onto the floor from his chair, and practice um, walking backwards, crawling, crawling backwards, crawling backwards, and then crawling down the stairs backwards to escape a fire, which, which he dreaded. That was something he had a great phobia of, dying in a fire. And insisting that Americans pay attention to the worsening crisis in Europe and in Asia in the late 1930s, Roosevelt heightened and thereby mobilized the fears of the American people. In his annual message to Congress on January 4th, 1939, that is, in the months before Hitler violated the Munich Agreement of the fall of 1938, and in the months before Hitler began threatening Poland. Nevertheless, in those early months, Roosevelt used repetition and vivid language to stimulate the fears of Germany among the American people. He warned Americans, he warned Americans, all about us rage, wars, undeclared wars, military and economic. All about us grow more deadly armaments, military and economic. All about us are threats of new aggression, military and economic. The nation's ocean moats, he said, no longer suffice as protection. Roosevelt said, the world has grown so small and the weapons of attack so swift that no nation can be safe. In August 1940, by which time Hitler had by now conquered most of Western Europe and the Japanese were threatening Southeast Asia, by that time Roosevelt told Americans that whereas in 1917, that is in the First World War, we were completely safe from any attack, that will never happen again in the history of the United States. He added, if the United States is to have any defense, it must have total defense. As he had done in fighting the Great Depression, Roosevelt tried to focus and mobilize Americans' fears of foreign threats. The president had in mind more than merely getting Congress to vote money to increase spending for warships, planes, and increase the size of the, of the army. He aimed also to link the domestic achievements of the New Deal with his foreign and military goals. He told Americans that New Deal reforms had fostered internal preparedness to meet foreign challenges. Roosevelt also sought, and this was important, he also sought to expand traditional notions of territorial defense into the far more expansive concept of national security, the concept we have today. National security was a far broader concept that justified both the integration of domestic and foreign policy and also the pursuit of goals in regions far beyond the United States and beyond America's territories. Finally, Roosevelt stressed the importance of technology as both a problem and a solution. Although advanced weaponry did, in, did indeed imperil the United States, Americans, Roosevelt said, had a natural talent for developing even more advanced weapons with which to protect the homeland and take the fight to the enemy. With the advances in aviation, farm, foreign bombers might reach America. But the United States, Roosevelt insisted, could produce more airplanes and better ones than could the dictatorships. With regard to technology as in other arenas, the 1940-41 period would prove a rehearsal for the Cold War. Roosevelt tried to manage Americans' fears of even more, of ever more deadly weapons by assuring them that they could gain and hold the lead in a technological arms race. And of course, that was America's strategy in the Cold War. In his January 6, 1941, Four Freedoms message to Congress, in which this is drawn, FDR emphasized first the extraordinary extent of the danger, he said. At no previous time has American security been as seriously threatened from without as it is today. The speech went through seven drafts, and each time the language was strengthened by accentu accentuating the urgency of the peril. Second emphasis of this speech was to mobilize fear in the promotion of concrete activity, specifically stepping up arms production and delivering some of those weapons to America's allies, the British and the Chinese. 
And finally, Roosevelt required that all major interest groups, he requested that all major interest, interest groups, business, labor, and agriculture, mute their differences for the duration of the war. The third element in Roosevelt's speech, in which the, these lines are drawn here, the third element in his speech offered an ambitious ad agenda for rendering the United States and the world safer, more just, and more secure. Roosevelt urged an expansion of the New Deal in order to make medical care available to all Americans, to bring more people into the social security system, to secure full employment, and to enhance equal opportunity. In this context of envisioning a better world for all Americans, Roosevelt concluded the speech with this famous peroration of the four freedoms, which would bring about a better world for all the people on this planet. In that January 1941 speech, Roosevelt interpreted freedom from fear as meaning a, world, a worldwide reduction in armaments to such a point and in such thorough a fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. This presents a, a problem and a question. Did Roosevelt, who was then frantically increasing the level of armament in the United States and increasing America's defense factories, ramping up America's capacity to produce for itself and for the allies, did Roosevelt really expect the United States to reduce its weapons even, even after the war? While Roosevelt might have believed that such universal disarmament was possible in the long run, the evidence suggests that Roosevelt expected that for at least the immediate post-war period, the United States would retain, would retain significant military forces, especially in air and naval power. By, by mid-1942, by which time, of course, the United States was involved in, in the war, by mid-1942, if not before, Roosevelt envisioned a post-war order in which the United States, Britain, Russia, and China would keep their arms, keep their arms after the war to enforce the peace and, if necessary, discipline the former Axis nations of Germany and Japan. And indeed, although the United States, after World War II, did demobilize much of its army, the United States still maintained the greatest navy and the greatest air force in the world. And of course, we retained for several years monopoly on the atomic bomb. Cold War presidents understood that fear could deliver acquiescence regarding their foreign policy aims. Harry Truman followed the advice of Senator Arthur Vandenberg, who told him in 1947 that if he wanted Congress to pro appro approve funding for aid to Greece and Turkey, which were then threatened by the communists, then Truman had to, quote, scare hell out of the American people. Truman did, you, did in fact, use that tactic successfully, and it worked. Congress voted to fund aid to Greece and Turkey. In 1948, Truman resorted to the same tactic in order to get the stalled Marshall Plan bill through Congress. The resulting fear in the country, aggravated by the Russians' explosion of an atomic bomb in 1949, August 49, and by the victory of Mao Zedong's communists in China in October of 1949, the fear in the United States established an emotional context in which Senator Joseph McCarthy could plausibly claim that the State Department was riddled with political perverts and sexual perverts, the two overlapping kinds of security uh, threats as McCarthy saw it. Fear spiked again during the presidency of John F. Kennedy. In contrast to Dwight D. Eisenhower, who left office warning of a military industrial complex, Kennedy emphasized the dangers facing the United States. He emphasized those dangers so as to justify his defense buildup and, as he put it, to get the country moving again. In late 1961, Kennedy went so far as to declare that the United States' position in the world, America's position in the world in late 1961, was, Kennedy said, as perilous. The condition was as perilous as it had been in early 1942. That is, the frightening time right after Pearl Harbor when Hitler uh, controlled most of Europe and the Japanese uh, had dealt a, a serious blow to the United States in the Pacific. Cold War America seemed to accept fearfulness as an almost in inescapable state of mind. 
Even taking into account such indisputably frightening elements as the atomic bomb, Americans seemed, during the Cold War, seemed impelled to embrace fear. They worried about the supposed security threats posed by a handful of communists or gay Americans, by far-off Vietnamese guerrillas, and even by rock and roll loving juvenile delinquents, of which I was one, um, <laughs> a, a very long time ago, far away. Um, with the doctrine of mutual assured destruction, the US government enshrined fear at the core of national security. To jump ahead to the war on terror, fear again became a structuring element in US policy and in American society. While the George W. Bush administration utilized public fears resulting from 9-11, certainly understandable fears, uh, in mobilizing support for the war in Iraq, administration leaders were themselves deeply shaken by the terrorist attacks. President Bush later recounted that, quote, six mornings a week, George Tenet and the CIA briefed me on what they called the threat matrix, a summary of potential attacks on the homeland. Between 9-11 and mid-2003, Bush said, the CIA reported to me an average of 400 specific threats each month. For months after 9-11, I would wake up in the middle of the night worried about what I had read. CIA Director Tenet remembered that you could not be anything other than scared to death about what the threat matrix portended. He added, you could drive yourself crazy believing all or even half of what was in it. Condoleezza Rice admitted that she had slipped into what she called a state of rational paranoia. Such fears are not, are not what FDR had promised in his January 1941 For Freedom speech. FDR understood that fear is most fearsome when it is diffuse, free-floating, and apparently impervious to action. Just as he himself had pursued physical, and indeed, um, ruthless physical therapy to wrest tangible victories over his paralysis, Roosevelt urged the American people to take concrete steps to co in combating the depression and the dictators. Despite all his service to the nation and the world, Roosevelt also took the United States, I would argue, onto a dangerous path. By urging Americans to climb down from the city on the hill to pursue their ideals and interests in the world, FDR helped lead the America along the path of informal empire. In ensuing decades, a belief in American exceptionalism would blind most Americans to the envy and resentment that was an inevitable cost of such informal empire. Although the four freedoms embody, embody values that are, that certainly are shared widely around the world, they are not universal values. Nor has the United States always honored its best values when dealing with the intractable dilemmas of global politics. It is not surprising then that American engagement in the world has sparked among some people a hatred intense enough to motivate, to motivate terrorist attacks on the United States. In this connection, we might recall what some of Roosevelt's contemporaries feared after hearing his pledge to promote, to promote the four freedoms, as Roosevelt put it, <laughs> everywhere, everywhere in the world. Law expert Edward Borchard observed that even the Crusades of a thousand years ago had a more limited objective. <laughs> he didn't mean that as a joke, but I mean that. Yes. <laughs> another critic, another critic, University of Chicago President Robert Hutchins warned that implementing the four freedoms entailed, quote, a program, program of perpetual war in Latin America, war in the Far East, war in the South Seas, war nearly everywhere. However we judge the prescience of Hutchins, it does seem doubtful that perpetual war can yield freedom from fear. The alternative to coming down from that city on the hill is perfecting the American model while becoming much more selective, much more selective about which global problems we choose to get entangled with. This was the advice urged in the 1960s by George Kennan, the famous diplomat George, George Kennan, who quoted in, a, in testimony before the US Senate in 1966, Kennan quoted from John Quincy Adams' uh, statement from July 4th, 
1821 when Adams was Secretary of State. Adams was talking at a time when there was uh, a lot of uh, support in the United States for America intervening in Greece's war for independence from Turkey. And Adams opposed that intervention. Adams said, wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be America's heart, her benedictions, and her prayers. But America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. If America did try to bring freedom to others, the fundamental maxim of her policy would insensibly change from liberty to force. America might become the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Thank you. The genius of the Four Freedoms speech, the genius, and it is genius, of the Four Freedoms speech lies in FDR's ability to make the abstract concept of freedom concrete. At its plainest, Roosevelt tells us freedom means freedom of speech and religion and freedom from want and fear. But there is, I think, hidden inside Roosevelt's folksy and really amazingly simple array here, not one but two ideas about what freedom really means, two definitions of freedom inside this speech. They're complementary, but they are actually in tension with one another. The first idea of freedom that Roosevelt identifies concerns what political theorists call negative rights. What are negative rights? Those are the rights that inhere in the human person and which no state or government can take away. Negative rights are those things that a government may not do to you, any individual in a free society. Government may not imprison me without due process. Government may not torture me. The government may not limit my right to free speech, except in a few extreme occasion, uh, cases. The government may not block me from practicing my religion. When FDR identified freedom of speech and religion as essential to any free society, he was speaking about the central importance of negative rights. The rights of individuals not to be harmed or abused by the tyrannical power of their government. But FDR's second concept of rights that free people enjoy is rather more political, and it's perhaps it's a little more, still today, a little more controversial. Those are positive rights, and positive rights are those things that citizens in a, in a civilized state can expect the government to do for them. The things that the government's supposed to do for you. These are the obligations that states have towards you. Roosevelt asserted governments have an obligation to provide freedom from want and freedom from fear to their people. And he spells out what that really means in that speech. We're only showing you a tiny little snippet, but there's a long, a long uh, 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 sort, of, sort of Christmas shopping list of goodies in this speech if you go and look at the full text. Listen to the things that he itemizes in his speech about what citizens in a democracy are supposed to expect from their government. He says, there is nothing mysterious about the foundations of a healthy and strong democracy, he says. Actually, FDR sounded just like my grandmother, so I, whenever, I'm, whenever I, hear, I hear him, with the, I, I kid you not, it really is uncanny. So what was it, what was the, what was it government supposed to do? The basic things expected by our people, he says, are simple. These include equality of opportunity for all, jobs, the ending of special privileges for the few, civil liberties for all, and even more than this, old age pensions, unemployment insurance, adequate medical care as well. That's also in the speech. These are what citizens in a peaceful and prosperous society expect from their government. And for FDR, these kinds of basic protections are what democracy is all about. That's what we're fighting for in the Second World War. So there's this double-barreled message in the Four Freedoms speech. I know, Four Freedoms, Two, two Freedoms, Trust me, there's really two major definitions you need to take away. There's this double-barreled message, and it's crucial to see both aspects of them. Good government is that which secures both negative and positive rights. Good government has to protect individuals from the abuses of power from their government, sure. But good government must also provide for the citizens and build a foundation of equality, fairness, and a social safety net that ensures that all citizens are treated with respect and dignity. This for FDR is the moral order, he used that term, that the democracies are fighting for. 
He says this moral order is, quote, the antithesis of tyranny. That's not quite grandma-like, but you know, you got the idea. The antithesis of tyranny. So what I'm supposed to be doing in this group of scholars is to, is to sort of follow the idea of the four freedoms out into the world, you know, since 1945, a small assignment. But now that we've boiled it down to these two basic concepts, it's a little easier to track these two basic themes, the positive and negative rights. Basically, my hypothesis has been foreshadowed by some of my colleagues. The radical edge of Roosevelt's speech here, um, the radical edge, the emphasis on positive rights, social justice, fairness, equality, jobs for everybody, Christmas comes early, all of that is quickly eroded in post-1945 America. In an atmosphere of the early Cold War, there's quite a lot of suspicion towards anything that sounds too left-wing. The Cold War triggered the Red Scare and the activities of Senator Joe McCarthy, as well as passage of federal laws weakening union activism, such as the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947. In these years, Roosevelt's New Deal came under fairly serious attack in the United States. And with the election of Dwight Eisenhower in 1952, who ran on a platform of smaller and lesser government, American political discourse pivoted sharply away from Roosevelt's emphasis on justice, on fairness, on equality. Instead, Americans embraced the priority of protecting their negative rights, our rights not to be bothered, hampered, or interfered with by the state. And basically, since the end of World War II, that's been the dominant coloration of American politics. You know, don't tread on me and get the government off my back, right? Let me put my argument here in pretty simple terms that, that are quite contemporary. If you walk into a bar in any American city, maybe not any American city, but most American cities, and you declare that it is 100% American to have freedom of speech, you're not gonna pick a fight, right? But if you walk into a bar and say, every American deserves government-supplied education, employment, housing, food, and health care, you might not get served. You might get more than that. So that's where we're at. We, yet these, both of, but both of these sets of claims are present in this one speech. Now, in the rest of the world, the situation is quite different. And in many ways, it's just the reverse. And that's what I want to spend my last few minutes talking about. Americans privilege individual liberties over the ideals of equality and fairness and social justice, but after the Second World War, the rest of the world is going just the opposite direction. The 50s and the 60s, much of the world is in the grip of revolution, anti-colonial war, Algeria, Indochina, Africa, the Middle East, Asia, mass movements all across the world, exploding all over the place, trying to overthrow uh, imperial and colonial governments. They wanted freedom. They wanted freedom from imperialism, freedom from foreign exploitation, freedom from inequality, freedom from racism. That's the kind of freedom that was mobilizing anti-colonial wars all across the world in the 50s and the 60s and 70s. The goal was to destroy the tyranny of colonialism, the oppression of foreign rule, and to get their newly formed states to provide, to end poverty and disease, to provide homes, to provide education, to provide medical care for the, for the poor. That was the goals of millions who rose up in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s against those old European empires. Many of these revolutionaries, of course, were Marxists. And they were frankly less concerned with individual rights, with individual liberties. In fact, many of these global revolutionaries generally believed that what mattered was for the state to assume the role of property owner, employer, union manager, teacher, even parent. And the Marxist idea, the state knew best. We're gonna build an equal society. It's gonna be terrific. There'll be no more conflict. Everyone will be happy. We'll all have work. We'll all have leisure. It'll be lovely. But everyone will have to support the state. and The state will look after you. But there won't be so much individuality. In order to construct this equal, equal this grand uh, egalitarian utopia, individualism is probably going to suffer. Well, how did it work out? By the mid-70s, as the wars of decolonization wound down and the post-colonial states across the world, Africa, Asia, the Middle East, emerged from the turmoil of decolonization, the world could see that the decades of colonial upheaval um, had not produced this perfect utopia. In fact, it wasn't pretty at all. More often than not, post-colonial states were run by dictators or one-party authoritarian governments. They were characterized by poverty, corruption, instability, persecution, oppression, etc. The wars against imperialism and colonization 
had sadly turned into civil wars. Political parties that had called for freedom and equality now imposed one party rule. They jailed political prisoners and continued to allow foreign corporations privileged access to their countries. So the, the anti-colonial nationalists that embraced the language of freedom had dismally failed to deliver. Well, starting in the mid-70s, a surprising reversal began to happen, began to occur. In direct response to the failure of these post-colonial states around the world to construct free societies, and in response to the obvious failure of what was going on in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, to build egalitarian societies, a new cry went up around the world, starting in the mid-70s. The simple demand for human rights. Human rights, those basic rights that all living humans carry within them, include the right not to be tortured, the right not to be jailed without due process, the right to freedom of conscience, the right to freedom of speech and assembly, the right to religious freedom, yes, in the 70s, having failed to construct an equal, just, and progressive world society, millions of oppressed people now sought to lay claim to their simple negative rights, those first two. The right not to be harmed and harassed by their own governments. So the global human rights movement that emerges in the 70s and took off as a global phenomenon in the 80s was the direct intellectual descendant of FDR's four freedoms. In fact, Roosevelt himself had stressed his goal was the supremacy of human rights everywhere. That's a little too Kennedy, I'm afraid. I'm, it's late, you know, we're moving now. <laughs> the ideal of human rights succeeded precisely because it turned away from the previous generation's pursuit of social justice and equality and fairness and positive rights. It limited itself to the most basic rights of all. The simple right not to be physically harmed by your own government. And these goals expressed by activists around the world, from Latin America to South Africa to Eastern Europe to Southeast Asia, just happened to circle back in an interesting way to the long-standing American preference for individual liberties. So perhaps the strongest evidence for this shift away from the search for social justice and towards the championing of individual liberties is the case of the dissident movement, if you like, in, in Eastern Europe in the 1980s. You will recall that the Eastern European activists who went out into the streets of East German cities in the fall of 1989 were not really calling for social justice, a revolution, or a new utopia. All they demanded was that their government respect their basic human rights to speak, to assemble, and to think without fear of retribution. This was precisely why the human rights movements of the 80s were so subversive and so dangerous and so powerful. They appeared to ask only for the basic respect of the human person. But this was an idea that could mobilize millions of people and even the communist governments, the regimes of Eastern Europe couldn't stop it. So it can be said that when the Berlin Wall fell on that remarkable night in November of 1989, ex almost exactly 24 years ago, the spirit of FDR and his four freedoms was present at the proceeding. However, before we engage in a big round of mutual self-congratulation for our collective role in ending communism, I just want to stress, in closing, that the triumph of this quintessentially American conception of individual rights, it came at the expense of its neglected twin. The vision that FDR had so eloquently spelled out in the second half of that form speech, a world based on fairness, on equality, on social justice, on universal access to education, employment, old age pensions, and medical care. If we want to honor Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms as we're doing here tonight, we have to do so by recalling that it was the product of a remarkable time in American life, a time when global, e the global economic crisis of the 30s, combined with the rise of terrible fascist empires, truly threatened to snuff out the very life of democracy. The stakes could not have been higher at the moment he gave that speech in 1941. And at this moment, at this dark hour, at the lowest ebb of the fortunes of, of freedom and democracy, Roosevelt called on Americans and all the peoples of the world to join together in creating a new moral order one based not only on individual liberties, but also on collective responsibility for other human beings. So as we contemplate the world today, and indeed as we look out on our own country with our 
um, somewhat woeful record of inequality and the persistence of hunger amid plenty and the poverty among abundance, it is safe to say that Franklin Roosevelt would tell us that there is still work to be done to bring about the triumph of the four freedoms everywhere in the world. Thank you very much for your patience today. Thank you. That was just as good as I hoped and anticipated and had every expectation. Uh, what we're going to do, I realize we're running a little bit late, but we're going to have just a few questions from the audience. And I would encourage you to uh, stick around for those questions because afterwards there's going to be a wonderful surprise. So, uh, any questions from the audience tonight? Uh, sir, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, waiting for the microphone. Thank you. When Roosevelt addressed these four freedoms, he was also seeking uh, to make war. And his enemies were a, a German socialism and an Italian socialism. Why didn't he put more emphasis on a freedom to earn, to own and earn property? which would go some way towards securing the first two freedom and demonstrably goes very far in promoting the third. The fourth will, would never be achieved. Panel? Because believe it or not, in 1941, capitalism was in pretty bad odor around the world. And uh, we, don't, we, we, we find this hard to believe given its extraordinary triumph globally since then. But uh, it, throughout the 1930s, of course, the de Depression had tarnished the capitalist order. It had made democracy look weak. The parliamentary democracies of Europe had collapsed. They were pathetic. They had appeased Hitler. They had done nothing. So to stress private property, which is, of course, a, a basic you know, negative right, the government can't take away my private property, would have been to, to appeal to essentially you know, Americans are basically just interested in, in ownership. And he's clearly trying to reach a, a higher level of idealism to mobilize people to, to join in America's uh, a, a moral, new moral order. The other thing, and I'm sure Frank will want to talk about this, is, is, is just that uh, Roosevelt's not quite sure where he stands on whether or not the United States is going to get into the war. Does he want to be in or does he want to be out? Yeah, I'd pick up on Will's point. It's also, I think, the point that Although this speech is very ideological, talks about ideas and so forth, uh, Roosevelt thought that the situation in 1940, 41, 42 was above all a situation perilous because of the power politics involved. And, and regardless of the ideology, uh, it was really Germany and Italy, Japan were threatening powers because they were expansive powers. It wasn't just their ideology that was the problem, it was the fact that they were trying to expand their ideologies at the expense of other, other governments. There's, a, there's obviously a battle for public opinion going on at this time over how deeply the United States is going to get involved with this uh, gathering world crisis. And obviously one of the things that Roosevelt is thinking in, in uttering this, uh, this kind of peroration about four freedoms is that he has to uh, set his heights high and, and, and try and mobilize opinion behind you know, loftier ideals for why the United States um, um, you know, should move forward with aid, aiding the democracies in the war against um, totalitarian regimes. Also, I noticed in your question reference to uh, German socialism and Italian socialism. I think one of the things that we always need to take into account is what we define as socialism. It was one of those words that was bandied about then and is bandied about now in ways that are less than precise. So I'm not sure a French socialist today would think that the government form of so, of, that was uh, used in Germany was socialism. Uh, because although it had some government ownership of private property, in Germany was much more focused on the unitary state mm. rather than on the sharing of wealth or the taking of ownership. I think, yeah, if you're a socialist in Germany and under Nazi rule, you ended up in a concentration camp. <laughs> not, not. Uh, right, right. Uh, so they didn't 
the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well I'd, I'd remind you that the name of the party was the German National Socialist Workers' Party. They tried to claim everything, they didn't claim the environment, <laughs> but they, they, they would have gone for that too. So the point is, the name of the party was National Socialist, but that, that meant something very different from our understanding of socialism. Yeah, the, par the party was formed before, I mean, before Hitler seized right. membership of the party way back in the 1920s, and he still, he just kept up, you know, kept the old name really, essentially, and uh, as, as Frank said, in order to try to kind of attract as much support as possible. Yes, please. I really have two questions. The first, as I was listening about the freedom from fear, the question came to my mind, is that the genesis of the United States becoming the police of the world? Is that where it started? And the second um, point that I wanted to ask is words matter. And so when you say the first two freedoms are po uh, negative and the last two are positive, I would argue that the first two are positive <laughs> because they protect my individual rights. They're not, the, a government's not taking it away, it's protecting and giving. Where the last two freedoms, I would say, are negative because it's putting a burden on me to provide for things that individuals, you know, and in particular freedom from want, should be responsible as much as they can to provide for themselves. However, I understand that there are circumstances where people can't and that America has been an amazingly generous nation to around the world. And I think we have a responsibility to do that, but um, especially today with healthcare debate going on, um, it feels like trying to provide for everybody is taking away from too many. So I, I just like your thoughts on that. Well, let me, I'd like to say something about the, the negative and the positive. Uh, I think we'll term them negative because really the I, government. Not my term. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, answer okay. You, you but well, whoever made that term, it's not a question of the government giving us anything. Those rights exist in nature and we have them as as uh, when we're the moment we're born so that the negative part of it means that nothing they can't be taken away from us by government the government is uh, is a force and I, and I think part of what you're saying about the health care law there is nothing in the history of the world that is more dangerous to human freedom than government name a government Soviet Union Elizabethan England Governments are dangerous things to individual freedom. The problem is we have to have government in some form in order to live together in community. So this balancing is such an important part of discovering the nature of what it makes, what makes us able to progress. And I think focusing on um, why, why, we would ever have to support another human being economically can get us in some trouble when we start to understand that we are bound in community or else we really have nothing. I often tell my law students who are talking about, like I make them come to class, I'm an evil, evil professor, <laughs> that uh, they'll say things like, I paid tuition, I can make my own decisions on whether I come to class or not. And I often tell them, well, you know, you pay tuition, but your tuition doesn't pay very much toward what I'm going to give you, nor did it build this building, nor did it supply the books in the library. So we have to be really careful about how we, what we are saying about our individual economic commitment, because really we live in community. Now, that doesn't mean that I think I should be giving all my money to everybody, but it does mean that there's a balance even there. Mm 
That's the price you pay for being an American. Well, and, I, and, I, and I think one of the, at the heart of your question, really, I think, if, if I may, is a, is a discomfort with particular kinds of issues that the government might might decide to exert greater and greater control over. But I think we to, to reinforce Linda's point, innately there are a million and one different things that we encounter every day that the government has decided for the good of society, that the government has decided for the good of society to control. I mean, we have speed limits. And you know, we have the Food and Drug Administration doesn't allow people to put botulism in your food. And that's a government program. So really the question is, what forms of government intervention are going to be positive or negative within the marketplace and within society? Because uh, your point is, is a valid one, that there are things that the government could do to really muck things up. The question is not, it sh it's not an analog, should it be nothing or anything? It's what, what is it? Yeah. I'd just like to say that, uh, that I, I really like what you said because you inverted, you know, it's wonderful as a teachable moment when you get your thing thrown back at you and turned on its head, and I really appreciate your careful listening. Um, and it, what you've said just tells us that we are all still debating what these four freedoms means. We, many of us may have different interpretations of what they mean, what role the government should play in our lives, what are our individual and inalienable rights, it's wonderful and yet still um, quite, uh, quite surprising that we really do still significantly disagree about how to interpret these. And, and it, I think what's interesting is that Roosevelt threw them all in together and said, well, this is quite simple. <laughs> and it's not simple at all. It's very difficult. These are the critical issues about our democracy. And it's just uh, fascinating to see them all wrapped up in this basket that he, uh, he presented very casually. What? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. It was the freedom of, yeah. Well, I would say that part of the motivation, that's part of a larger picture. I mean, part of the motivation that led Roosevelt to include all those four freedoms as part of the thinking that was, was part of Roosevelt's efforts to vastly broaden America's participation in world affairs, eventually leading, helping lead to World War II. And certainly in the years after World War II, the, the leaders who followed built upon what, what Roosevelt did. Um, whether we think that's good or bad, or it's, you know, it's, that's a debatable question. But certainly, this is the period 1940 41 is a turning point in terms of increased American involvement in the world. Well, and, and let me add, because <clears throat> I think this is really crucial, because Roosevelt obviously was controversial in his day and remains controversial to our day for this very reason. To go back to your question, you know, one could paint if one wanted Roosevelt to be any number of political stripes. One could suggest that the New Deal was, as many did of the day, you know, <laughs> a step towards tyranny. But I think it's important to remember that Roosevelt was very explicit, that even as he was being critiqued as perhaps someone who was dismantling capitalism, that his goal was to save capitalism, that he thought that capitalism had gone too far, had caused the Great Depression. What do we need to do to keep this going so that we don't actually become something other entirely? So he's trying to tweak, and other people took it as to great offense. But his goal explicitly was to save capitalism. Now, you can argue whether or not that's what he was doing, but that's what he thought he was doing. Sir. Well, it does seem there's a political dynamic behind all this that, that was probably, I don't know if it was unleashed by Roosevelt, but by the, the circumstances of the 30s and into the 40s. And that dynamic is, is, starts with us saying, well, we can all agree that we should probably transfer some income from the wealthy and the successful to the people who need it the most. And I think most people would say that that's a noble uh, objective. But the political dynamic here is the political process doesn't know how to stop that. And they soon start expanding it, and pretty soon what's going on is you're transferring money from the politically unorganized to the politically organized. That's not necessarily the poor. You've, uh, you've got a situation now where over 60% of the federal budget is just transfers. It's not producing things. It's not providing <clears throat> goods and services that are generally available, public goods. It's just you know buying votes with other people's money uh, by transferring from one group to another group. 
And, and the harm of that is you have a situation now where the people who pay the highest, well, they don't pay, but they face the highest marginal taxes in America are poor people because they don't get most of the money, but they start losing the money they do get when they decide to get a work, go to work, when they decide to work hard, get an education, uh, improve themselves. And in many cases, they're, pay they're facing over a 100% tax rate in terms of what they lose when they make another dollar. And that's very, very destructive. And it starts from you know good intentions, mm -hmm. but there's a dynamic there where politicians, they don't particularly like the market because the market allows other people to protect themselves, to help themselves. Politicians want to take credit for that. They want to be the <clears throat> ones that are doing explicit things to help people who need it. Their rhetoric is wonderful, but the reality is rather pretty pitiful. No, no. <laughs> Pretty sure that was a statement. <laughs> discuss, discuss. Is that <laughs> well, you know, you, that, I think that was a statement, but just I'll just take the first crack at it, which is simply to say, um, you know, I think we're here to discuss Roosevelt's four freedoms and its lasting impact, its lasting echoes. And I, I think the, the, the safe way to begin that conversation is just to remember the extraordinary moment at which he delivered this, this speech and why its rhetoric is so lofty country was unsure of where it was headed, deeply divided over whether to be involved in European and Asian affairs in terms of the war at all, uh, had come out of a terrible long struggle and an ordeal of depression in which the government and capitalism, the free market, seemed to be broken. Um, it was not a happy time in American life, and Roosevelt is making an appeal for unity. That's really what this speech is about. Who are we? Can we stand up against these thugs? If, if we're going to stand up against these thugs, we better know who we are and what we're willing to fight for. Well, here's four things I'm willing to fight for. Now, 70 years later, those things, we live in a very different time. And you're quite right. The size of the government is far, far vaster than Roosevelt could have imagined in 1941. Uh, the complexity of the tax system, the complexity of these entitlement programs, it's taken off in... It, it's almost like we're on Mars compared to where he was. But let's just remember what he was trying to do at this moment and why it still has the power to inspire us even though we do live in a very different environment. I'd like to say something. Uh, can you, uh, are we, we're gonna get your microphone. Okay. <laughs> we wanna hear you. <laughs> I was in the ninth grade when that speech was made and my father had died six months earlier. My mother had already died and I was 14 years old, and I can still hear his voice. There's nothing to fear but fear itself, and it meant a lot to a young teenager. And uh, years before that, when the German submarines were on the Jersey co uh, coast, uh, we had a summer place with, we had a blackout every night, and um, I stood at the surf one e evening at twilight, and I cried to the waves, where are the grown-ups? We young people were looking for, for some kind of leadership. Our, our teenage boyfriends were going into the service after that, of course. It was a terrifying time. So I can still hear his wonderful voice calling us to be, to, that the worst fear is fear itself. And it stuck with me all these years. I just turned 87, and I'll never forget it. So that is not a question. I just want to thank all of you for your comments. I actually I, I do have a question for you. When you listened to Roosevelt, did you think he sounded like Will's grandmother? <laughs> well, listen, uh, we have a special treat for you this evening because we're so appreciative of you coming out. Um, we wanted to do something special, and I thought to myself, what really symbolizes freedom? And for me, the singular answer came back, ice cream. <laughs> So, outside for you, there are ice cream sandwiches, and we can all toast with cookies and ice cream and uh, celebrate freedom in that way. And please join me in thanking our guests for coming all this way. <laughs> <laughs>